Head mic. Oh, nice. Hey, this thing's on. All right, well, once again, pleasant good evening. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. First and foremost, want to welcome the Goforth family back. You were sorely missed. Man, I knew I had big shoes to fill when I started this job, but then when they go on vacation, you just really realize how much you appreciate having people in your life. That's for certain. So it's good to have you guys back. It really is. Um, we had a great Sunday. We, started, we had uh, a wonderful celebration for Pastor Arlen and Sister Penny, and we had name tag Sunday, but uh, I think this week we're going to call it uh, Reader Glasses Sunday because we had all those name tags and I couldn't read a lick of one, you know, so maybe, maybe we'll do something different next time. Um, tonight we're back in the book of James. We're in chapter three. I've titled it The Three T's. That just simply stands for Teachers, Teaching, and the Tongue. Again, we're in chapter 3. Um, tonight's lesson, James is going to review the qualifications and the results that a Christian teacher should strive for. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer and we'll begin. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for once again an opportunity to dig into your word and study. I thank you for all those that have made it out here tonight. Father God, I ask just pretty simply right now that you just speak through me. Speak for me, Father God. I just ask that this message go out and be received. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so far in the book of James, we've, uh, James has been teaching us and telling us, uh, he's been talking to, rather, all Christians and describing the Christian lifestyle, if you will, the kind of attitude, the conduct that us as believers are supposed to have in different situations. And I got to thinking about, you know, why do we come to Bible study? Obviously, to study the Word, um, you know, but we're not here for an attendance uh, contest of some sort. We don't get a star when we push, when we come in the evening. Um, it's certainly an opportunity to socialize, but that's not what it's for. You know, the real idea for us to come to uh, study the Word is to grow spiritually. It's to find some sort of practical something that we can apply to our spiritual lives is what I'm trying to say. So, having said that, I'd like to review real quick what we've been talking about. If you have grown and learned from the book of James so far as a Christian, uh, you will know that you face trials, and that's with a maturing faith. You know, you face those with patience and joy, knowing that God is maturing your faith through these. You know, you've learned something as far as you've had something trying or difficult or maybe something serious in your life that's happened, and you've not broken down and fallen apart over it. You haven't gotten mad. You haven't done one of my favorite things, pouted and sulked uh, because of something that's happened. Um, you've realized, hey, there's more going on here. I'm, you know, my faith is growing. I'm, I'm maturing as a Christian. You've grown as a Christian and learned from the book of James so far if you face temptations with Christian action. You know, you've faced and responded to temptation with Christian action. And we've talked about this before. What is Christian action? It's recognizing, first of all, that you're being tempted. Uh, saying, wait a minute, you know, I'm, this is, I, I know what's going on here. Uh, a recognition of what's happening. And then immediately praying for wisdom. Praying for wisdom needed to face that temptation. And then you ask yourself questions, you know, how am I, what do I need to do here? How do, how do I do this? How do I resist? Well, um, what do I need to understand about what's going on? And certainly ask for help. I mean, we can always ask help for God, but sometimes we even need help from another person. Maybe even an institution, if there's something that's got a hold of you and you can't let it go. And then changing your ways. I talked about a few weeks back about changing the dynamic. I know for me in my life, the crowd I was running with was doing nothing for me spiritually. And a lot of them have reached out, man, you don't hang out anymore. And I'm like, you know, I love you and I miss you. And I think you have a terrific family, but my walk right now says that I need to be where I'm at, and I have to separate myself. Take yourself out of the fire, if you will. You know, if there's something that keeps getting in the way, if there's some sort of temptation that keeps causing you to stumble, you, ne you need to change the dynamic in your life. So you've grown as a Christian and learned, if the book of James... You've decided not only to listen to the Word, but actually do what it says. Imagine that, right? You know, you're not, try you're not just trying to understand. You're not trying to tell others what the, the Word of God says. But more importantly, you're trying to figure out how you can do what, 
what the Word of God says, how you can apply it realistically to your life. You've grown as a Christian and learned from the book of James so far if you've began to treat everyone equal. You don't make any distinctions based on race, wealth, any other differences. Remember we were talking last week or before we had Finger Food Fellowship that those that are walking the Christian lifestyle, we don't treat anybody differently, whether it's race, culture, gender, what somebody has or they don't have, whether they've got more education than you or or less, whether they're a blue-collar worker, white-collar. We treat everybody the same, all kinds of different people. They get the same regard. You've grown as a Christian and learned from the book of James so far if you've demonstrated the sincerity of your faith by doing good works and not just good talk. Good talk's good. We all need good talk. But we learn good talk isn't valuable unless it's backed up by good works the last time we were together. So this is a little review of what we've talked about so far. In chapter 3, James is going to be targeting and specifically speaking to those in the church who want to teach. And uh, again, so far, James has been talking about things that all Christians need to do. You know, all Christians, things that all Christians need to learn. Now he's talking again specifically to those that have the responsibility to teach. Some of you teach in our Sunday schools. um, Or those that have been called to teach. That's who James is speaking of. So tonight, James is going to review the qualifications that Christian teachers should have and the fruit that they need to produce if they're going to successfully serve in the ministry. And again, whether you're a Sunday school teacher, uh, a Bible uh, study teacher like myself, whether you're preaching or just encouraging someone. I had a brief convo with Brother Kip right before he walked up, you know, like talking Pastor Ronnie, the other one of the things I was teaching in and Matthew, he was like, hey, have you thought about this? Have you taken a look at this? Brother Kip shared with me a fellow from our men's fellowship was really struggling with uh, the Ten Commandments. He served in Vietnam and did some things he no doubt uh, lives with and had some concerns on whether or not how that affected his salvation. You know, so James is talking about what kind of qualifications do those kind of people have? You know, people that wouldn't even consider themselves a teacher yet, but in so much so, they are. So James, in chapter 3, is not talking about formal training. He's not talking about formal education. You know, do you have a degree? Uh, do you have some sort of training? I mean, it possibly couldn't hurt any of us to, to dig into divinity or, or those things. I know I'm certainly looking at it, especially if you're in some sort of a specialized ministry. But not everybody or not only the ones that are up here, I should say, teach. There's an opportunity for every one of us at some point to encourage another brother or sister and maybe teach them or share with them something that they didn't know. Uh, And again, many of you in the congregation, especially you ladies, uh, you teach classes. Some of you are carrying on and having Bible studies and devotions at the clubhouse where you may live. You know, or, or like I would just use as an example, Brother Kip, who, who might be encouraging another brother. So let's talk about what the qualifications of teachers are. We'll begin in verse 1. First of all, James says you have to be prudent. You have to have prudence. Verse 1 says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. So he's saying don't jump at the opportunity. You know, be a little prudent because with responsibility, is coming a whole lot of accountability. You know, we all get examined. None of us can miss that. You know, there's a time where uh, God's going to pick us up and hold us. You've heard me use this expression before, hold us up to the light of truth and find out what our faith is about. Or maybe we're in the fire. We're being dipped in the fire of of temptation and trials in our life. And he's going to figure out, one way or the other, what kind of faith we have. We all get examined. Nobody escapes that. James is saying not only are you going to get that kind of an examination, but if you're going to teach, there's a little something extra for you, and you need to know about it. So he says, be prudent, consider the consequences as well as the rewards, especially if you're seeking the teaching role in the church. He says, don't be quick to teach, but don't be quick to speak either, which brings us to our next qualification of a Christian teacher. 
Control the tongue. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into horses' mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So what does James say about control of the tongue? He says it's easy to sin with the tongue, and controlling it is a really hard thing to do. However, he points out that a person that can control the tongue, this person possesses a a certain maturity about them, a certain ability to have self-control and control what they're doing. Why? Why why should we control the tongue? Because it's easy to sin with the tongue. It's easy to stumble into foolish talk. It's easy to stumble into gossip and lies and mean-spirited conversations. There are many ways we can sin with the tongue, church. So James is saying a person that controls their tongue can usually control their mind and the rest of their faculties and other areas of their life. And then he gives us a couple examples. He says the rider who controls the horse by pulling on a small bit in the horse's mouth. Or he talks about the command that a captain has of a ship by the turning of the small rudder. So the point that James is trying to make is that a a mature Christian directs his his entire body by controlling his tongue. And this is the kind of teacher that is acceptable to God and a blessing to the church when you find him. You know, it's it is necessary to control the tongue because an uncontrolled tongue is dangerous. It can cause a lot of destruction. I, I stand before you convicted of the things that have come out of my mouth. And this was a tough lesson for me to, to go through. Let's go on to verses 5 and 6. He says, The tongue causes destruction. So also, the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The very world of iniquity, the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. So an uncontrolled tongue causes destruction. James is using some strong words here. You know, it started out with a small bit in a horse's mouth or the rudder of a ship, but now he's, he's getting a little bit more serious. He's talking about you know, a small fart, a small uh, spark that can start a fire and burn down an entire forest, you know? The same way, a small part of your body, an evil tongue, can set us on fire and send us to hell. So again, it's some strong images that James is using to point out the evil in the tongue. And again, why? Why is he getting serious now? He's, he's already told us that the rudder and the, and the bit in the horse's mouth. It's because no other body, no, no other part of our body can get us into as much trouble as the tongue can. We just experienced that, didn't we? <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly. You did really well. You know, the tongue helps to plan sin. The tongue helps to encourage sin. The tongue joins in sin. It defends it. It spreads it to others. So this is why the tongue is dangerous, because it causes a lot of destruction. It's also dangerous because, again, it's extremely hard to control. For every species of beast and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of of deadly poison. So again, James is giving us examples, only this time, now he's using the animal kingdom. Now, if there's one thing I've seen, it's a lot of the animal kingdom. I got a chance to be part of a circus industry for 24 years, and I've worked alongside a a lot of terrific trainers, animal trainers that really knew their craft, Um, a wonderful bunch of families that found a a whole new way to carve out a niche in life and, and put into service animals to help them garnish a wage. I've worked alongside some massive elephants. This is Kimberly sitting on her cousin's elephant, Luke. 
He weighs about 12,000 pounds, and he stands almost 14 feet tall. Kimberly's 4'11 and a half, just so you know the contrast there. Uh, I'll let her tell you her weight. We won't do any of that. Um, just the startling of an animal like this. Just, just the startling of an animal like this. He moves to the side. 12,000 pounds will crush you. It can kill you. But he's a very well-mannered young man. Uh, I say young man. He's probably in his 30s, mid-30s, early 40s. And they live well uh, into their 80s and 90s like humans do. They have a lot of the same body system, temperature, and, and different things like that. Uh, we did magic illusions in Miami. Uh, and Kimberly was pregnant with one of our babies. And her cousin and I ended up doing some magic. And we walked side by side with the tiger trainer. That, that there was a path to the back of the big top circus tent. It wasn't wide enough to get a transport cage. So he leash walked a 400-pound tiger. And only capable to do that because he had a rapport with the animal and uh, very well trained. I was hosting a show in Salina, Kansas uh, at the Bicentennial Arena. And this tiger is on the outside of the cage. If you look to the left of the photo where it's dark, there's a tunnel where all the cages line up. He managed to jump out and was loose for about six minutes. She loose for about six minutes. And we were able to round her up in the ladies' bathroom. We brought the roll-up cage, and they managed to get her back in there. But we couldn't have done it if she wasn't trained. Here's another good-looking woman. Kimberly, in our lifetime together, 25 years, the 26th of this month, she's had the only performing Rottweilers in the world. Behind her sits about 750 pounds of dog collectively. And again, I remind you, she's 4'11 and a half and never has a problem when she walks anywhere with them. She's the only person I know that's ever been told she could bring all six to a, a vet at one time because they trust her training. They trust in what she teaches. So James is saying all kinds of animals have been trained and put into service one way or another for humans. But the tongue is near to impossible to tame and control. And the evil it produces is often hard to stop once it begins. Gossip, insults, lies. Now here's what I mean. We were using confetti in a show. The lights get hung up on these trusses up at the top, and we had confetti canisters. And at a certain point in the finale, the confetti would come out of these canisters and it would rain down. Now, underneath the seating area, we had fans. We had fog machines. And this creates the particulate in the air and the light shine through, and it gives you all this terrific showbiz ambiance. The point I'm making here is this confetti ended up everywhere. It was in the performance area, the backstage area. It was over by the bandstand. It was in the seats and people's drinks. In every show, we had to clean it up for the next show. And it was almost impossible to get all of the confetti back and put it back into the containers. And we had to just put up with it because that's what the producer wanted. This is the same way it is with the tongue. One little story... One little misunderstood thing goes from one person to another, and pretty soon you can't take it back. There's feelings being hurt, even if you wanted to, or an insult. And you don't have to even say anything to insult anybody these days. You can raise an eyebrow, or you can side-eye somebody. My kids call it mean mugging or resting witch face, you know? And people, they keep insults for a long time. They'll keep that stuff forever. You hurt somebody's feelings or insult them, they're like, they will write you off. I've got, a, I've got a thing in my life right now with Kimberly's uncle that we had a falling out, um, and it's never been right ever since. And I've made, I've extended an olive branch. I've said I'm a new man. I'm a, trying to be a preacher, and he won't have it. I insulted him too much. Or a lie. How many lives have been ruined by a lie? It's all from the tongue. Tongue causes destruction. It's hard to control. And James says it's also going to destroy our witness. He says, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree... My brethren, produce olives, or a, or a vine produce figs, nor can salt water produce fresh. So James is saying the tongue can destroy a Christian's, wit a Christian's witness. And I know this, how many times as believers you, you see uh, 
someone say something eloquent and they're, they're speaking nicely and they're blessing someone and then they turn around with the same tongue and you hear them lose their fruit basket. I'm going to paint a picture for you tonight. I didn't ask Pastor Allen if I could do this, but this is completely fictional. I just want to make an illustration here. Anybody that's hearing me outside, we have a wonderful pastor. He's a strong man of God and none of this happened. It's just an example. So we come here every Sunday and Pastor Arlen, we all feel, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. He speaks from his heart, preaches the cross. You can see it, you can hear it. We see him pray, we see him sing, we see him give glory for everything that he does to God Almighty. And then we go to Lake Waimama one day. And we're hanging out with some of the people from church and a few people have got fishing poles, they're out there fishing. And all of a sudden, Pastor Arlen loses his bait to a fish or maybe a log because somebody happened to step in his casting lane and he threw it in a different spot and he drug it. Now it's hung up. It's got his favorite lure on there. And he starts to lose his temper. He blames the other church member for obstructing his casting lane. You know, maybe even says things that are unbecoming of a pastor. Screaming, the brother should pay attention. You know, get out of the way. Dad, gun it. You know, whatever. He, what I'm saying, he's speaking vulgar. And James is saying, can we do that? Can we speak the same mouth, praise God, and, and, and sing praise and worship songs at church, and then sometime else, someplace else, start speaking in a way that's not right? You know, and all kinds of trash comes out of our mouth. Things unbecoming of a Christian. Things that destroy our witness, I was heavily convicted when reading this, this chapter. People are going to judge you too. People will judge you as evil. If you speak evil, you know, out of, what, is it, what does the scripture say? Uh, out of the overflowing of the heart from the mouth. Well, I'm getting my words mixed at this point. But he's saying, look, if that's what's in and it comes out, people are going to judge you by it. That's exactly what he's saying. And, and what we're talking about tonight, he's saying anybody that's like this, that's trying to teach, uh, they're going to do more harm to the gospel than any kind of good. So James has missin- mentioned, rather, some necessary qualifications that teachers must possess. He's saying have some prudence. He's saying control the tongue. You know, if you have these things, then, you, you know, you have the privilege of teaching uh, God's people. But he also describes some fruit that, that Christian teachers need to produce. You know, not only should they be prudent and control the tongue, but you should see things about a Christian teacher that is evident of their walk with Christ. So Christian teachers must produce fruit. The same principle applies to teachers, and the fruit is a witness for them. Who among you is wise in understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. Let me read that again. Who among you is wise in understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds and the gentleness of wisdom. So what kind of fruit does mention here in chapter 13? He says you've got to have good behavior. You know, he lists three important virtues needed for those to aspire to teach. One, right off the bat, is we have to demonstrate a high moral character. You know, we're all sinners, we're all weak. And I was thinking about this, I even looked up some statistics. As a minister, uh, if a minister in a church has an affair, or not even an affair, let's just say a one-time event, uh, he gets weak in the flesh, and, uh, and he has a fling, and it's found out, and he tells the deacons, he goes to the, the senior pastor, or the the elders, or whoever might be there in the church, and he tells them that he's made a mistake. That guy's career is over. I know you could look back in time, and there's a few preachers that have managed to kind of reinvent, but I don't think they've ever had the trust, and they've ever had the, the confidence of the congregation that they had at one point. Now, if you're something else, if you're a contractor, you know, an engineer, uh, a plumber, no offense if anybody's any of this, you know, your home life is going to be ruined, certainly but you may not lose your job. James is saying, if you want to be a teacher, you need to be prudent, you need to watch your tongue. But he says, teachers, they should bear fruit, and one of the things they need to do is be on their best behavior. There are certain things that they have to have in check 
You don't have to look very long on the internet. I just briefly Googled something like uh, the number one cause for new pastors and teachers, Christian teachers, fail. Anybody want to guess? Sexual sin. Some sort of an affair. You know, the, the person can be forgiven by God. Uh, we, we serve a God of second chances and then some. They can be forgiven by their spouse and their family. Even the church, they'd be prayed over, counseled. They can move on, so to speak. But that person never, ever again will be able to be in the ministry. Not successfully, in my opinion. James is saying if you want to be a teacher in the church, there's some things you have to have under control, and that's one of them. You know, you can hit your, well, you can hit your thumb with a hammer and, and drop a curse word, if you will. We're all human. That's forgivable. That might not keep you from losing your position as a, an associate pastor, if you will. I'll use myself as an example. But, but there are certain things that you should absolutely, uh, to save your witness, He's also added to this fruit medley that you should have good deeds. You know, faith's witness is good deeds done in humility. You know, actions done with gentleness. Actions done without pride. Your good deeds are done because they're good. Your your good deeds are done because they help other people. Your good deeds are done because you want to witness to Christ and to others that your faith is real. And it's sincere. You're not done because you want to puff yourself up and make yourself better than others. And that's what James is meaning here. Finally, he mentions the source of this type of behavior, and he says it comes from wisdom. And he talks about two kinds. Two kinds of wisdom he describes that exist, and the kind that's necessary to be a teacher. Talks about wisdom from below. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant, so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. So James is saying there's this type of wisdom that comes from below, excuse me, and it's earthly, he says. You know, it's coming from the earth. It's, it's wisdom of man. It's, it's not wisdom of God. Saying it's natural. It's going to appeal to the flesh, this wisdom. You know, you're going to think it's right in your mind in that fleshy instant. But it's, 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 of, it's wisdom from below. And then he says it's demonic. He's just referencing who controls it. The wisdom from below is from Satan, not the Spirit of God. Earthly wisdom from below certainly has an intelligence to it, but its fruit is destructive. You can learn a lot from uh, being wise in the world, I guess you could say, you know, but you got to be careful of the fruit. What fruit does the wisdom from below produce? It produces bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, you know, that, that feeling of it's all about me. It produces arrogance. And uh, a certain type of religious zeal that causes bitterness with uh, other brothers. You know, it's good to have this religious zeal, to be on fire for God, if you will. But a lot of times when you let the flesh, that wisdom from below, lead you in it, uh, you'll start doing things from a different angle. It'll be something based in pride, and that's going to lead to bitterness is what James is saying. You know, it's not a competition. It's not a competitive zeal, if you will. It's a kind of zeal that when, when some, I mean, that's good for sports to a degree, I guess. But uh, the zeal in church should promote service to God. I, I'm reading a book right now, a wonderful book about a preacher. And he had a, he had a, a scripture, nevertheless, not my will, but his will be done. That's the kind of attitude we have to have. You know, iron sharpens iron. We should have the kind of Christian zeal that, that encourages someone else to try their best at what they're doing. The worldly wisdom from the blow is not like this. Uh, it doesn't produce joy. It doesn't produce peace. 
And that's, James is saying that should be the natural fruit that we put off. For those that claim to serve God, that's the kind of fruit, I mean, produce joy, produce peace, that's what he's saying. Disorder and evil action. Where these things are present, he's saying there's sin. And the source of the sin is, again, that wisdom from below. So earthly wisdom produces a zeal for God based in pride, is what I'm trying to tell you. When you're allowing that, that earthly wisdom, that wisdom from below to lead, guide, and direct you, uh, it's going to produce bitterness in disciples, not peace. Bitterness in, I say disciples, but believers, us Christian brothers and sisters. And again, this kind of wisdom is a witness that's against the gospel. It's not for it. Now, I want you to keep our main idea in mind, what we're talking about. I get off on these tangents and stuff like that. James is describing what kind of teacher do you want? He's, and, and James is saying in this passage, you want a teacher, if you want to be a teacher, you need to be a, a teacher that's prudent, a teacher that can control the tongue, and you've you got to have good behavior, and you've got to be doing good deeds, and you've got to have wisdom from above, not the wisdom from below. I'm sure we could all say that we've seen the kind of wisdom from below in churches from time to time, haven't we? I know I have. Uh, in and out of church, even, you can, you can see this kind of stuff. I've seen people compete in church, bitter, <laughs> bitter arguments and fights over how to do something. They're not fighting over, is Jesus the Son of God? No, they're, you know, you're not having Kip and Neil back there in the back having some sort of, no, I say it's this way and it's something fundamental belief-wise. No, I just use these guys as examples because they're my brothers. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. <laughs> you know? It's, it, the, the fights that we have are about who's going to get their way. This is my territory. You didn't ask my permission. You're using my guy. That's my guy. Helps me with my group. It's earthly. James talks about another kind of wisdom. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. It's gentle. It's reasonable. Full of mercy and good fruits. It's unwavering without hypocrisy. James is saying wisdom from above comes from our Heavenly Father. You know, it's spiritual in nature because the source of it is from God's Word. Right here, right in the Bible. It's also controlled by God. So what kind of fruit does the wisdom from above produce? Glad you asked me. It's a fruit that is pure. You know, you can see it for what it's worth. You can see it on that teacher. You can see it on that brother that's sharing with another brother. You can see it when Pastor Arlen's preaching with a fire from his heart. It's peaceful, and it produces peace in others. It preaches peace. It goes before you. It walks, it walks through the door before you do. You know, when you see a group of people working together, and they're all under the leadership of a, of a certain person, and everybody's got this amazing cohesion. It's just running along like a fine-tuned machine, just, just humming along. You know, James is saying that person that's leading them, he or she's doing a good job. That's what James is saying. They're saying that that person that's leading, they're a person that's meek and reasonable. He's saying that's the quality of character of an individual, not the person that's interested in puffing themselves up or insisting that they have their way all the time. You know, they're not manipulative. This wisdom from above, above is merciful. It's kind. It's compassionate. It's sure. It's exact. Don't you love it when you know exactly where somebody's coming from and you know what to expect from them? They're a steady Eddie in your life. You know exactly every time you approach them, you know, there's some people, hey, man, how you doing? And then you regret instantly <laughs> that you asked them. Yeah, you all know what I'm talking about. Be nice. He says, in sincerity, meaning it's not hypocritical. James is saying here, good teachers demonstrate wisdom from above. This stuff on this slide right here is the criteria for that. You want to be a good teacher? embody every bit of that right there is what he's saying so let me talk about some practical helps we got about 10 minutes uh, i want to talk about some practical helps for those that want to become wise teachers like myself 
And I'm going to do it from one of the wisest men and teachers in the Old Testament. See, James has given us the qualifications uh, necessary for a Christian teacher um, to teach God's people, but he doesn't tell us necessarily how to obtain them. You know, the qualifications that James mentions are, again, you got to be prudent. You got to have tongue control. You got to you got to produce that that heavenly wisdom, that fruit from the heavenly wisdom. But King Solomon adds to the instruction by showing how one can become a wise teacher. He says, "Listen carefully. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel to understand a proverb and a figure." The words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So where do we start to become a wise teacher? Well, we start by listening carefully when receiving God's instructions. You know, when we get God's word, this is the first place we got to stop. Why? Because he tells us, uh, he talks about the fool, and the fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, the fool is the fleshy person, the fleshly person, the person that operates like we just talked about with that wisdom from below. The flesh doesn't want to hear the wisdom from above, and it will offer a lot of distractions to keep you from hearing it. You know, um, this is one of my battles. It'll, the flesh will offer up distractions for you every chance it gets. Uh, right now, I'm all about intake. I'm trying to read uh, books about pastors. I'm trying to read, m- most importantly, the Scripture. And then I'm, I, I'll read commentaries, and I'll read my, my Power Bible software, and it's probably 30 different translations of the Bible, and it's, it's got commentaries and stuff like that. So I'm all about the intake is what I'm trying to tell you. And I can tell you... <laughs> that every time I say I'm going to sit down and study, something happens and gets in the way. And I'm hungry. Maybe I'll get a bite to eat first, and then I'll study. And then I get done eating, I'm like, you know, I got a full belly. Maybe I'll, uh, I want to have the right frame of mind when I go at this, so maybe I'll just relax a little bit, take a little cat nap, and I'll get back up. Or uh, I look over at my beautiful wife of 25 years, and I say, man, she's asked me to fix the chicken coop or do something. She wouldn't do that. She does all that herself. But the point I'm getting at is the flesh gets in the way. You get all these other reasons on why you shouldn't be listening to God's Word, why you shouldn't be paying attention. So if you want to be a wise teacher, you've got to listen carefully, and you've got to pay attention to what God is teaching you. And he says you've got to respond immediately. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God, keep his commandments, because this applies to every person, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it's good or evil. Now, I got to tell you, this is probably one of the scariest passages in the Bible for me. Everything, every single little thing you've done, every idle word that's come out of your mouth, everything's you're going to be held accountable for. Now, this is the end of Ecclesiastes. This is chapter 12, the last chapter. And, and King Solomon is talking about all the things that he has tried in life. You know, he's tried alcohol. He's tried beautiful women. He's tried construction projects. He's, he's tried owning slaves, politics, power. I mean, that's pretty much what he's writing about. And you know, he says, it's all vanity. It's all empty. His conclusion in, in chapter 12 right there. When it's all said and done, he's saying what really counts is listening to God. Listen to what he says and obey it. This is one of the wisest men to ever live, church. I think we could take some of the things he said to heart. You know, he's saying when you, when you hear something that requires a change, when you, when you see something that needs an effort, or if there's something you need to repent about, he's saying do it right then, right now. There's no better time. You know, they say the best time to plant a, an oak tree was 100 years ago. You know the next best time to plant an oak tree? Today. If you want that big tree full of shade and what have you. The Word is only effective if we put it into practice. The longer you refuse, the harder it's going to become to obey. 
you'll run and you'll make every excuse. It just gets easier. It just gets further off your radar. It's not even anywhere close to you. That's the way it was for me. You know, when he says in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom, he's not talking about, oh, God. He's, not, he's talking about the recognizing his authority. Most of you know that. Respect God's authority. Listening with the intention of doing. That's the fear of the Lord that he's talking about. Listen without, listening without the intention of doing is hypocrisy. And obeying without carefully listening is foolishness. The next thing a teacher needs in his training is to control his tongue diligently. We've talked a lot about the tongue. Remember, James was telling the tongue is dangerous, and how do you become one of those wise teachers that controls your tongue diligently? Oh, let me go back here. When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. A person cannot become wise without tongue control. It's impossible. If you want to become wise and, and have knowledge, you, yeah, you have to have intake, you have to read, you have to study, you don't have to do all those things, but if you try to come to some sort of conclusion about how much you know and the level of wisdom you have by what you've taken in, you're in error. Because I'm telling you right now, uh, it's not based on that. When you open your mouth, people are going to decide right then and there exactly how much you know and what kind of teacher you are, whether you're wise or not. So James says the tongue is destructive in a world of iniquity, and we must control it. So how do we do that? And we're winding down. Here are some practical exercises that can help us develop that control. He says, learn to apologize. A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. He's saying if you sin with the tongue, apologize with it. The best way to cultivate humility is to say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I spoke too soon. And what I said was unkind. It's hard words to say. It can be extremely humbling. But I tell you this much, when those words come out of your mouth, the person who's hearing them is saying to themselves, this is a wise person. This is somebody that's counted the cost. Yeah. Person saying, yeah, a person that says, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, I was, I was, I was having a bad day. And <laughs> you'd be perfectly honest, what you were saying was driving me nuts. And I think you were completely off base. So let's just, let's just move on. Which response, who do you want to entrust with things out of those two? The person that's tenderhearted and recognizes the error in their way or someone that comes up and offers you just more, well, you know, not really taking ownership, right? The next thing says, learn to hold your tongue. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is considered prudent. It hurts. Learn to hold your tongue. What's the saying? It's better to, uh, to not speak and be thought of as stupid than to open your mouth and prove it. You know, when there's not much left to, there's not much left to say, rather, when we eliminate what's untrue, uh, what's exaggerated, what's distorted, what's unnecessary, what's coarse, what's repetitious, what's foolish. You know, we don't always have to say everything that's up here. And when we have that mentality, that's pride. That's, that's thinking that we're so absolutely terrific. These people are going to want to know everything that's going through my mind. And I can tell you the world doesn't need to know everything that's going through our minds. A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind, right? We've got to learn to filter what we say. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. You want to filter what you want to say? You want to filter what you want to write in an email or a letter or I'm going to give somebody a piece of my mind? Filter it through Philippians 4.8. I guarantee you what you say and what you send will be completely different. Learn to say the right things at the right time. The wise in heart will be called understanding, and sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. 
And then on in Proverbs 25, 11, it says, like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in the right circumstance. Doesn't it, don't you feel good when God inspires you to say something, you give something to somebody, and they're like, you just see the, the light go off, or you can see the shoulders loosen up a little bit. Doesn't that make you feel good when God gives you something like that? I know it does for me. God's given us speech to praise Him. He's given us speech to bless one another. He's given us speech to communicate how we feel about things and express ourselves. We just need to learn how to do this with graciousness, be wise and heavenly, you know, not, not foolish, insincere. Uh, one of the, we have this acronym in the Marine Corps, JJ Did Tie Buckle. It's 13 leadership traits, judgment, justice, decisiveness, integrity, discipline, tact, initiative, courage, knowledge, loyalty, endurance, all these things. Tact was always the one when I go for a meritorious board. They're like, all right, Marine, what do you think is the most important the leadership trait? I'm like, tact. You got to know what you're going to say and when you're going to say it at the right time. You know, that's in the world. I mean, people, my grandpa used to tell me, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Heavenly wisdom comes from wise teachers, and we can all become wise teachers of our children, our brothers, and sisters in the church. If we learn to, as Solomon says, listen carefully, respond immediately, and control our tongues. And again, this can be incredibly difficult to do. You can walk up on a crude joke that's being told and get sucked right in, and you're like, what were you going to say, Rick? Nothing. (laughs) Just go on. If you can learn to do that, or maybe a brother in the church has taken on a task around here and for some reason is dragging his feet and hasn't gotten to it or something like that, or a sister, you know, and you can be given an opportunity. To, oh, oh, I'm going to wait till he asks my opinion about this guy. I'm going to let him know. No. It's not what we do. Hold it to yourself. Keep it yourself. You've got nothing nice to say. That's what he's saying. And we're going to wrap it up. A couple minutes late here. James is talking about teachers, about teaching. In verse 18, he summarizes this up. He says, And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The teaching, that's the seed, that changes the hearers for the good will be brought by a truly wise teacher. You know, you'll know this person because he will already bear the fruit of what he's teaching. It's like we've already said. He or she will produce that, that pureness, that peacefulness, that meek, that self-controlled kind of character. And when they teach these things, it'll produce it in other people. So who are the wise teachers? Those are the ones who can promote you into the heavenly things you already see in them. Those are the wise teachers we're looking for. I thank you for letting me share this chapter. It was incredibly difficult for me because there's a lot of it that I have to own up to. There's people watching the words that come out of my mouth now that know the person I used to be. It's all about obedience. It really is. The striving to be obedient more and more every day. Let's pray and be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for an opportunity again to dig into your word. I thank you for speaking through me. Uh, I hope and pray there's been ears that have received it. I just ask that you would believe, be with everybody as we leave and go our separate ways. I thank you for your many blessings. I thank you for the courage and boldness to stand up here and talk about these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.